Hello, my name is Wayne Osborne, and today we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to talk a little bit about behaviorism. So what is it that I'm talking about when I'm talking about behaviorism? Well, first we need to understand that behavioral psychology is the study of external behavior. Okay. Behavior itself is very objective and observable, where what goes on inside one's mind is uh, something that can never really be known. And we also need to understand that behavior is a response that an organism gives to external stimuli. So a little bit of the history of behaviorism. Uh, perhaps one of the best well-known uh, representatives of this was Pavlov. He was a Russian physiologist who discovered what he called classical conditioning in dogs. This classical conditioning he then used to explain some learning of involuntary uh, emotional and physiological responses. Uh, in case of his dogs, the dog's drooling when it smells food, and then later when he would ring a bell. Uh, so it's very important for us as teachers to understand that since school is often the cause of unintentional learning through this classical conditioning, especially anxiety. Uh, test anxiety conditions us to have general school anxiety as well. So what Ivan Pavlov did is when he looked at these and he looked at this unconditioned stimulus up here of the meat, when he would present this meat to his dog, the dog would salivate. Uh, if he rang a bell and provided this for stimulus, he had no real response similar to this other than the typical response of picking up the ears or paying a little bit better attention the dog to see what's going on. Uh, he then began conditioning the dog. And he did this by giving him this unconditioned stimulus of the meat powder along the same time as ringing the bell. So at the time he's doing this, he begins to get this salivation because these are given uh, at the same time. Once conditioning was complete, all he had to do was present this condition, now conditioned stimulus of ringing the bell. And look what we get. We get salivation. Well, we see a lot of this uh, happen in many other ways, and how many of you, when I look out here, can tell me that you don't have a dog or a cat, but the minute you hit that can opener, the minute you open that door that's got that little special creep to it, that they don't come flying through the house to get that food. This is what we're talking about with this condition. So some examples of this uh, classical conditioning, uh, one of the examples that's quite often given is a child uh, that gets strep throat quite often and has to have his throat swab. Well, after a certain point of this, all he has to do is see that swab, you know, in that doctor's hand and they begin to gag. Uh, conditioning responses. Uh, another good example that they are giving is when you hear that phrase, we need to talk. Whether it's coming from a teacher, a boss, boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, whatever it may be, that you kind of have this fluttering, this sense of foreboding to it that, you know, something is wrong, whether there actually is or not. Uh, the main point that I want to get through to everybody is that we learn to associate a stimulus with a response. Okay? And eventually our body does this automatically in the presence of the stimulus. So this response becomes involuntary. Uh, classical conditioning can be overcome. Uh, it can be undone. This happens naturally. Uh, in the case of Pavlov's dog, uh, when they, over an extended period of time, do not receive the meat with this stimulus, 
uh, it begins to play or uh, begins to fade. Uh, it can also be done through uh, therapy. Uh, somebody being afraid to fly, test anxiety, different things like this. Uh, you know, a considerable amount of uh, psychological therapy in order to overcome these automatic reactions. Uh, and, and the key point to remember is that this classical conditioning is more than forming an association. It is an involuntary physiological response to whatever that particular stimuli is. Uh, it's conditioning in the classroom. Okay. We need to start looking at this a little bit from the education standpoint, where we look at it from teachers. Uh, Simple things such as playing soothing music, dimming of the lights to calm and relax students are techniques that have been used. Uh, we have some unintentional classical conditionings that result in test anxiety, math anxiety, public speaking anxiety, or just general school anxiety. Uh, this test anxiety is something that I deal with quite regularly in my classes. And I have several students that I've been working with for quite some time to overcome this and to learn how to properly take a test, how to overcome this. And I'm beginning to see some progress in some of them. Uh, so that, that's really a, a, a plus to me that I'm starting to feel good about a couple of my students that they're, they're learning how to overcome some of these uh, unintentional conditionings that we've put upon them. And we did this, okay? We as a population of educators, administrators, uh, we have created the environment over the years that has created these different types of anxiety in these students. And now we need to start finding ways to get beyond them. So we go a little bit beyond uh, what Pavlov did, and we look at a, uh, another psychologist, this happens to be an American psychologist uh, by the name of B.F. Skinner. Uh, he was interested in education, and he believed that behavior is sustained by reinforcements or uh, rewards, not specifically by free will. Uh, and he did a lot of his work with rats, pigeons and then applied that to uh, humans. So really we're nothing more than a bunch of rats running a maze. Uh, so his operative conditioning, what he did with this is operative conditioning is voluntary uh, and it involves controllable behaviors and not an automatic physiological response that we would see in classical conditioning. Okay. With operative conditioning, the response comes before the stimulus. Okay. This is completely the opposite of what we saw uh, in, in classical conditioning. So what, what are we doing with this? Uh, here with this, we look where we can deliberately use this operative conditioning with our students. Basically, we're going to train our students to present these behaviors that we want them to present. And somehow someone actually reacts to our behaviors determines whether or not we continue this behavior. Okay. So if we're rewarded for something that we uh, do, then we're likely going to do it again. Okay. Uh, you know, if I do something, you reward me, I want that reward again, I'm going to do it again. And this is that psychological mindset that is out there that we need to tap into as teachers. And we have three different phases of this. Uh, we have what's called positive reinforcement. Uh, this gives a presence of a, or offering of a pleasant stimulus. We have a negative reinforcement. And this, this one you got to kind of little think a little bit about. This is basically an absence of an unpleasant stimulus. And both of these will lead to an increase in a wanted behavior. Uh, we also have the third and least desirable of these, and that would be punishment. 
And punishment is basically the presence of an unpleasant stimulus uh, with the goal of causing this behavior to decrease. So let's take a look a little bit closer at this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, with positive reinforcement, you behave in a certain way that results in a reward. So as a result of this, uh, you are more likely to repeat that behavior. Okay, this, this is pretty common knowledge. Uh, the one that seems to hang a lot of people up when I'm talking with them is this idea of this negative reinforcement. And this can actually play into your favor if you use it correctly. Uh, with negative reinforcement, when you behave a certain way, that re it results in the removal of something unpleasant. Uh, and as a result, you're more likely to repeat that behavior. Um, a, a kind of an example of what I do with that is I combine the two uh, on exams and how they study for the exams. And if they score within a certain range, then they receive positive reinforcement. They receive a reward. Those that fall above this specified range, they get this positive reinforcement, but they also get a form of negative reinforcement. Uh, because the school that I happen to teach at here is very big on remediation, very big on test corrections. Uh, and this goes out to the general populace. So anybody that scores an 85 or above they receive some positive reinforcement of one form or another. Uh, but if you score a 95 or above, you get to have a free period. While everybody else is doing their test corrections, doing their remediation, this is your free period. You can do what you want during this time. I mean, as long as you are not disturbing my class, this is your time. You know, hopefully, you're taking advantage of it uh, and using it to your benefit to you know, get ahead on some material within my class or even to catch up in another class. Um, it may be nothing more than you're listening to your music. And in the very beginning when I started this, I did see that the majority of the people that managed to make it into this were very few and that they would often choose to listen to music be on their phone, whatever it may be, and be undisturbed while the rest of the class was uh, doing their test directions. Uh, but now, as we're approaching the midway of the year, I'm seeing more and more people and more and more that are falling into this category. And the really great thing is that I'm seeing some of them that as a result of some of these other reinforcements, maybe putting in the earphones and listening to the music, but they have at work, either from my class again or from another class. And so we're seeing that in both cases, something happened that was perceived as good. And as a result of it, they began to exhibit this behavior more. Uh, and in the example that I just gave, the behavior ultimately was them studying and following the study techniques that I gave them to help them excel on my exams. Uh, punishment. <clears throat> this is really one of the least desirable, um, at least for me, because I'm not happy if I'm out here punishing people. So punishment is a consequence that follows a behavior so that the behavior is repeated less often in the future. Uh, punishment can involve adding something. Uh, you get a speeding ticket, you have to pay a fine. You receive points on your driver's license. This is a punishment. Uh, after this, you're less likely to speed. Uh, this is that same thought. So it may be something as simple as staying after school. It may just be a five-minute lunch detention. Uh, you know, just anything that they perceive as a punishment. Uh, it can also involve removing something. Um, losing privileges, you know, anything along that line. Uh, in both of those cases, either I'm adding something or removing something, 
uh, it is perceived as bad. And if I do something and the result or consequence is kind of perceived as bad, I'm not going to be so inclined to repeat that behavior. And these are aspects of the site that we are looking to uh, basically exploit in our students to, to get them to behave in the manner that we need them to behave in order to escalate and maximize their learning. So there are a couple of basic differences between this negative reinforcement and punishment. Remember, negative reinforcement, something unpleasant is removed. Okay, so negative reinforcement, we are removing something uh, unpleasant. So as a result of that, we're more likely to repeat that wanted behavior because something happened that was good. Uh, whereas with punishment, the consequence is something that we do not like. And as a result, we're less likely to repeat that particular uh, behavior. And again, the punishment can either be the addition of something or taking something away. Regardless of which we do, it is something happening that can be perceived as being bad. So that kind of wraps up what I wanted to present to you. And now my challenge to you is to actually stop, think, and uh, review what we've talked about or what I've presented to you. And think about in your classroom what you can come up with for examples. Can you come up with any examples of this classical conditioning, the operant conditioning, positive, negative reinforcement, punishment? Uh, what are some of the things that you use? Uh, what are some of the things that you're interested in using or ideas that you might have on how to employ these techniques in your classroom?